consists of uh, one bell assembly and one valve casing assembly, which again consists of three walls and three slides to make this part of the, of the trumpet. And we are given that each of these, both the sub-assemblies here and the components will have a certain lead time or production time, which needs to be considered when uh, you are creating a plan. And now we should actually create one such diagram for all parts of this product structure diagram. One for the trumpet, again, one for the bell, and the bell, as we know, it will take only one bell per trumpet, so then the demand will be uh, the same, or actually given by the net demand here, because the adjustments here are uh, given for, uh, for the full final uh, trumpet, so the net demand here will actually be the same as the demand for the bell. We need to take the time factor into consideration here, so we need to uh, produce or start producing the bell two weeks before this, but otherwise the net demand or eventually some adjustment for that sub-assembly will then be the, what we, we need to produce for that, uh, that sub-assembly. And similar, the valve casing assembly, the net demand for the full trumpet will again be the demand for the valve casing assembly, and we need to start production four weeks before this week, which is in week eight. And to create one valve casing assembly, we need three walls and three slides, which again has some production time here, three and two weeks, and also have three of each is needed to create one of the valve casing assembly. So then we both need to consider the multiplicative factor and the time aspect. So the net demand here will again give the demand for the sub-assemblies and the components and at the lower levels. And each of them could also have some ingoing inventory and some adjustments. So you need to create one such diagram for all parts of this uh, product uh, structure diagram. The final product the sub-assembly bell and well casing assembly, and the components, valves, and the slides. <coughs> uh, so, we talked about the so-called lot-for-lot lot strategy, which is to produce actually uh, exactly what we need in each period. So, if we now assume, we can look at one of these, for example, the bell, which is the simplest one. Uh, and we, we know that for valve casing, we need to have valves, we need to have slides in other products. We might have some other components here. But let's now assume that the time uh, diagram here is based for the bell assembly, which has the, net dem has the actual demand, what we have seen here for, for the full uh, trumpet. So this is now the demand we need for one of the, the sub-assemblies here, the bell in this case. Uh, and if we now are start looking at this one, we take that week into consideration and then the, for, for the bell we have two weeks of production time, so we can just use six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 instead of 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Then this will be the actual demand. And if we should use the lot for lot principles, it means that in week six, we should produce 42 bells. In week seven, we should produce 42 bells. Week eight, 32. Week nine, 12. And in week 10, 26. This would now be um, the production plan according to the lot for lot principles. But as I also have mentioned earlier, this is probably not the best strategy because you will have setup cost, 
you need to start production or eventually send an order in all these weeks, which will be costly. It might be better to send orders uh, to consider the demand for several weeks in advance. Um, then you will have some holding cost, cost of storing from one week to another, but you don't need to have setup cost for each of, of the weeks, e each of the, of the periods. And then we can start looking at different strategies to find out what is the optimal production size or ordering size according to a given demand like this. And we saw different methods. Um, last week we saw the silver mill method, we saw the part period balancing and also the least unit cost method. We have also seen that this is possible to uh, formulate as an LP pro uh, program, uh, LP uh, problem and solve to optimality if we know exactly all the um, all the variable values. Uh, but there are also other models. We could, in this case, also look at the EOQ formula, which we have used in similar problems, which also is a, we have seen, it's a very robust formula and can be used for uh, different types of problem, also these types of, uh, of lot sizing uh, problems, with some adjustments. <coughs> so let's now assume that we have, uh, we are given some variable values uh, that we, for example, have a setup cost in our example, which in the example from the textbook is uh, two workers working for three hours to a cost of $22 per hour, which gives a total of 132. This is the cost of setting up, starting a production. And now we assume that we, we have to start up production every week, produce this, the necessary number we need. This is done at the start, uh, start of, of the week. Uh, so in a lot for lot strategy, you will have a cost of 132 every week or every period. We also have the holding cost, which can be calculated as the, well, the interest rate, internal interest rate could be given as the interest rate per year, 22% in this example. But since we now are dealing with a demand per week and the cost of storing from one week to the next, we need to divide by 52, which gives us 0 0.004, yeah. which is the interest rate for storing one item in one week, 0 0.004. Then, of course, multiplied by the value of the item. And in this case, we are given that the cost of materials are 141.82, which means that the holding cost is the interest rate multiplied by C, the value, which again is 0 0.60 dollars or cent, six, 60 cents per week. Uh, so now we know in this case that to set up a production, which means set up of uh, machines, uh, transferring or uh, workers to uh, uh, yeah, do the, the work of setting up a machine and start production, we need to pay $132, but the storage cost, the holding cost, is only 60 cents per week, which makes it probable that sometimes you should just skip the setup cost and then 
produce more in the week before, so you have enough for the demand for, for the coming weeks. So we can now try to find. Professor. Yeah, question? Uh, the I, it's, is it, uh, it's right? Is it right? The is it 22? Uh, well, the I is 22 per year. And uh, it went, uh, 0 0.22, of course. Sorry. Thank you. 22%. 0 0.22 divided by the number of weeks, which is 52, which gives 0 0.04. 0 .004. 0 .004. 0 0.4%. Uh, for storing one uh, item of inventory for, for one week. Uh, and we can also try to use the EOQ formula for this example. We then need to know about the demand for the same period as we have the interest rate. So since this is given per week, we need to know the average demand per week. Or demand is here lambda which is and then we could count well just to raise the table here but in the example from the textbook which we will use we have a total of 10 weeks demand of 10 weeks a total of 439 and divided by the number of weeks makes a total demand of uh, 43 or an average demand of 43.9 per week. So now we can use the EOQ formula, try to find the optimal order size in the case where you have an average demand per week or a similar case where you have a constant demand of 43.9 per week. So let's now assume that we had a similar situation where the demand is constant, then we could find the EOQ formula divided by the holding cost. 2 multiplied by 132 multiplied by the demand per week, 43.9, divided by the holding cost per week, 0 0.004, which will give us an optimal order size of 139. <coughs> and of course, with four weeks of lead time and a known variable demand, the orders must be placed when it is necessary to avoid a negative inventory. So we cannot uh, just find a fixed interval like we would have done if this was a constant demand, but we need to make sure that the order is received exactly uh, so, so we don't have a negative inventory. So sometimes when you have a large demand in some weeks, you might have a very uh, short cycle time for this order and sometimes you will have a longer cycle time. So let's now assume that we have the demand and we can also assume that we already have done the time uh, time uh, uh, well we have uh, adjusted according to the time aspect so then we know that the demand uh, is given as the example in the textbook and we can start counting from week number one because we have just shifted to the actual week where we need to, uh, yeah, we, we need to to start the production of, of these uh, items. So, no. week uh, we start one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. We have a given demand here, which is uh, found by 
looking at the net demand, like we saw in the previous table I showed uh, in the uh, last uh, lecture. We are given now the demand for each week, 42, 42, 32, 12, 26, and then continue, 112, 45, 14, 76, and 38. So this is now the given demand according to orders and forecast, and also adjusting adjusted with uh, current inventory. So the demand here are given, and if we now want to use this order size or production size, let's call it order, then we should order or produce 139 in week one. This number will meet the demand here, but will also makes it, uh, make it unnecessary to produce for a given number of periods. So let's now look at the remaining inventory level. Okay, if we are producing or ordering 139, we have a demand of 42, means that we have 97 items left. 97 will also meet the demand in week number two, so we don't need to produce or order anything there. And then we have 55 items left. 55 is enough to meet the demand in week number three. No new setup cost there. We are left with 23. 23 is enough to meet the demand in week four. So no setup and 11 items left, but then we need to produce again. 139, which is the order size or production size found by using the EOQ formula. 139. And we still have 11 left on stock, which means that we have a total of 150. And uh, we are using, we have a demand of 26. That means that we have 124 left on stock. And then we have a very high demand here of 112, but we have 124 on stock, so we will use all them, and then ha we have 12 left. But then we need to make a new order of 139. We have 12 left, which means that we have 151 in total. We have a demand of 45, which means we have 106 left when the week or the period is over. 106 in period 8, we need 14. No setup, 92 left. 92, we need, one, uh, we need 76, so then we don't have to order again, but we have 16 left. And then, this is not enough to meet the demand here, so we need to place a new order of 139, which makes 139 plus 16 minus 38 is 170. So this is now a production plan which can be used as an alternative to the lot for lot strategy. Lot for lot, as we remember, L for L is uh, the setup cost in all 10 periods, but no ordering cost. We are producing exactly or ordering exactly what we need in each period. So that means 1320 the setup cost multiplied by the number of periods, which is 10. So this is what we now should compare with. What is the cost here? And cost of this strategy will be set up in period 10, 7, 5, and 1. Four times the setup cost. But then we also have 
lots of inventory on stock, so we need to sum the sum of the inventory here. This is now the number which is stored from one week to the next. And the sum here will be 653. Quite much. 653. This is now the number of items stored from one week to the next week. So, the total cost of the strategy is now 653 multiplied by the holding cost, which is given as 60 cents per week. Which makes a total cost of 918.80. which is, well, considerably much better than the lot-for-lot lot strategy. So here, by using the EOQ formula and adjusting it slightly to deal with a variable but known demand instead of a fixed demand, makes it possible to, uh, to improve the solution from the simplest lot-for-lot lot strategy. We can also talk about uh, produce all in period one strategy, which means produce a total of 439 in period one and store for all the periods, which will be uh, quite uh, expensive. You will have only one setup cost, but you will have lots of holding costs. I don't have the exact number here, but you can try to find it find out what is the remaining part of inventory for each month, find the sum and multiply by the holding cost. So these are the two extreme strategies, the lot for lot and the produce once. This EOQ strategy is some kind of balance between the extreme strategies, which makes a better or a lower total cost, 918.80 instead of 1,320. But of course, this is not optimal. We can very easily see that this strategy can be easily improved if we know about the demand. We assume that the demand is known, and then we can easily see that, okay, we have set up here, but we have some items left on stock before the next setup. We don't need to store these 11 items. We can just not produce them at this point. We know the demand and then just make the plan. We have used the EOQ strategy to find which periods we need to have set up or production, but we don't have to produce exactly 139. We can adjust it to meet the exact demand for the periods that this order is going to span. So let's now say that instead of 139, we only produce 128, which makes the inventory here 86, 44, 12, and 0. We have nothing left, but we will have a new production here in period 5. And in period 5, we have to produce for the demand in period 5 and 6. 26 plus 112 is 138. Makes 112 left here and nothing left here. And then a new production in number 7. We have 16 left on stock here. Uh, so we, is that, I uh, need to look at my notes here. We should have 100 and, uh, 112 left and zero. And then we should produce 45 plus 14 plus 76, 135. 
and we have uh, 90 uh, left here. 135 minus 45 should be 90. We have 76 left here and nothing left here. And then the last period, we only have to produce 38 and have nothing left. This means that the sum instead of 653 would be 420. And now the cost will be, still we have four setups, 132 plus 420 items multiplied by 60 cents of storage or holding cost will give us a total cost in this case of 780. which again will save a lot of storing cost compared to the previous strategy where you produced exactly 139 items. So here by just looking at the demand, use the EOQ strategy and find the optimal, uh, find the, um, by using the EOQ strategy, find the uh, ordering size for a similar uh, problem with a fixed or constant demand, find out which periods you should order or produce, and then adjust the number of items to produce according to the number you need for the periods this order is going to, to span. Then you can save a lot of inventory or holding cost compared to the strategy when you are producing it in a fixed uh, size here. But like we saw last week, it is even possible. This is, uh, well, this is not a bad strategy. Uh, 780 compared to the extreme strategies is, uh, well, quite considerably much cheaper. But we have some other uh, types of uh, heuristics which we presented last week, which I will not repeat very much, but we remember that we used the silver meal strategy. which is uh, also one strategy to solve these types of lot sizing problem, silver mill. Um, in general, the general formula for calculating the average or for the, the, the average cost per period is to have the setup cost, K, plus the holding cost in one period, multiplied by the demand for the next period, plus two times the holding cost, multiplied by the demand for the period, two periods ahead. And if we continue, we can put up the general formula as the number of periods minus one, like we can see here, this is period three, and three minus one is two, multiplied by the holding cost and multiplied by the demand in period number j. Find the average, which means divide by the number of periods j. This is the general formula for the silver meal technique. And like we saw last week, start by looking at produ production for one period, then continue looking at the production for two periods ahead and three periods. And then we should stop when we find the lowest value of the average cost by using the formula here. And then we should start looking at the plan from that particular period. We also looked at the least unit cost, which is quite similar. Which use the same nominator as this one. Call that nom nominator. 
but instead of dividing by j, we should divide by the number of units. R1 plus R2 plus up to Rj. But similar, look at one period, then look at two periods of production, then three periods and so on, and stop at the number of periods that will give the lowest value per unit, the least unit cost. Difference between silver mill and least unit cost is silver mill is dividing by the number of periods, the least unit cost is dividing by the total number of units for the time span of, of that order. And we looked at one third, the part period balancing strategy. which actually didn't use a formula like this, but rather found out for how many periods should we produce to make the balance between the two different cost types, make, choose the number of periods where the holding cost is closest to the ordering cost. So, in our example here, we know that the order cost is 132. Look at the holding cost for, well, holding cost for producing in one period would be zero. Producing in two periods will be 42 multiplied by 0 0.6. For three periods is still 42 stored in one period and 32 stored in two periods and then choose the number of periods to produce for where the holding cost is closest to the setup cost of 132. So this is one of the, well, the, the third of the three well, major or well-known strategies to, uh, to, to decide about the number of periods to uh, to produce for in such a lot sizing problem. But these are all heuristics. Heuristics are some what we call the myopic. They will only look one period ahead at a time and they are not able to analyze what will happen after these periods. It will make one decision and then start planning all over again. And we also saw one example how to formulate this lot sizing problem as an LP problem, a linear programming problem, and solve it to optimality. So let's continue a bit on that part. <coughs> and then we have this modeling lingo PowerPoint file, which is also uploaded in Fronter which shows first yeah, first error the use how to use the help file searching for one particular command here which is the binary command the zero or one um, um, type of uh, of uh, variables uh, and we saw this example which is the same example as we have used here we can see here that this is the demand for the given weeks, 42, 42, 32, 12, and so on. The demand for the given weeks. 132 is the setup cost. The D, or what we saw in our file, was the delta. We called it delta variables. I would rather use that one, I think. So we saw this lot size problem, the lingo formulation. Shown here. Here we have the deltas, which will decide whether you have a setup or not have a setup in one particular period there. If delta is one, you have a setup. If delta is zero, you don't have a setup. <coughs> so what um, 
we have here is the objective function, 132, the set of cost, multiplied by the sum of the delta, which again is the sum of the, or the number of periods when you have a setup. In our example here, we would have four periods of setup, but this is not necessarily the optimal solution. And in addition, we have the holding cost of 0 0.6, from here, multiplied by the size of the inventory in each of the 10 periods, the values of this line here. So the first constraint set will be the production in period 1 should meet the demand of 42, and if you are producing more, it will be stored as inventory in week number 1 the remaining part here. And then, if you have production in production two, in, in period two, or if you have something left on stock from period number one, you should meet the demand of 42, and the difference will be what is stored as inventory from week number two, which again will be the ingoing inventory in week number three and so on. So here, the production in the current period plus the inventory which remains from the previous period should meet the exact demand and the remaining part will be stored as inventory to the next period. So this is the balancing constraints between production, demand and inventory. The next constraint set tells us that the production in each week, week one, two, three, four and so on, production in each of the 10 weeks will be smaller than or equal to one constant, in this case 439. 439 is the total sum of the demand, the sum of this line, a total of 439, which means that there is no need to store, to produce more than 439 in any period because then you will produce too much. And this constant could be something uh, else also, but uh, in this case, 439 is the absolute maximum to produce, and multiplied by delta. If delta is 1, then you will have a value in the x production uh, variables. If delta is 0, something multiplied by 0 is 0, and then the axis has to be Zero two. You cannot produce in a period if you don't have setup. And uh, as default, the variables cannot be negative. So zero is then the lowest number by default. And the last constraint set here, binary command, that the delta variables should be binary, either have the value of zero or one. If the deltas are zero, no production in that period, if the deltas are 1, there will be production in that period. And then let's solve this to optimality. And we will find out that the optimal solution looks like this. Objective value of 610.2, which is well quite much smaller than any of the other alternatives. You will have production in week number 1, week number 6, and week number 9 production in three periods. Produce 100, now this is the inventory level. Inventory level left on stock after each period and the production size in each period. And this is also quite similar to the last or, or the last uh, problem in, in your assignment where you should uh, formulate an LP and solve uh, in, in lingo, the LP formulation of a similar uh, lot sizing problem. Okay, let's take a break and then I will continue with some more advanced use of this lingo and LP problem system and then also probably start talking about scheduling. <laughs>